Well, in advance of that launch, let's talk with Keith Cowing. He's the editor of NASAWatch.com. He's also an astrobiologist and former NASA employee. I guess, uh, you know, we, we've got so much light pollution out there. Jim Spellman did a story on that. You can't really see all those stars out there. But back in the day when we were younger mm -hmm. and you could, I mean, it's immense. But when he talks about, you know, 1,500 planets out there, I mean, it's mind-boggling. Well, it could be more. I mean, there's a satellite now that's coming towards its end, Kepler, which this satellite's been to replace, and it's found 3,800 worlds. And so, you know, John had a number. The number that they're expecting to find, it just depends how long you look and where you look. And they were surprised at the number of planets they found with Kepler, which was sort of looking like a little straw at one part of the sky, whereas TESS is going to be looking at the entire sky. So I've heard people suggest that up to 20,000 planets of something similar to the Earth could be found, um, or they could find more. That's, we won't know, as I say, proverbially until we start looking. I see how animated you are when you're talking about this. This is a big deal, isn't it? It is, because with Kepler, people knew we'd see something, but not as many worlds. And the, the number of Earth-sized worlds that we did find, I said Earth-sized. Uh, you can have a planet that's the size of Earth, going to be, be too hot for life or too cold. Well, what this mission's going to do is it's picking out the brighter stars closer to Earth, and it's focusing more on the smaller planets. Because as, as in your intro piece, you know, the larger the planet is, the more it blinks out a star, and it's easier to find. But it's the smaller worlds, the ones that are our size, maybe a little bit smaller, larger, and stars like our sun. That's where we're hoping to find worlds that could be supportive of life. That's the next step. Mm -hmm. But will this thing find life? No, but it gets us a lot closer. How long? I mean, it's a, it's a long process, though, isn't it? I mean, it is. And this is going to be in a weird orbit. It's going to go way out past the moon and come back in again. And it will send its data back every two weeks. And the mission is supposed to last two years. But uh, as with most of these satellites, it could last 10 or 20 years. So again, a lot of people who were uh, just astonished by what Kepler did are just really prepared to be even more astonished by what TESS can do. Uh, China's heavy lift uh, carrier rocket, the Long March, uh, could launch in late 2018. We know China's getting very active in the, uh, in the space field. Um, you've got SpaceX, you've got NASA. Uh, it, it's a lot more cluttered, but it's a lot more exciting, isn't it? Is this a golden age of, of space exploration? It's going to be sense? more than just a golden age. For example, with China, they've just started to operate their 500 meter telescope, and it's much larger than anything on Earth. And Breakthrough Initiatives, as a privately funded organization, is using that satellite dish, among others, to look for the possibility of signals from other civilizations. Add in the fact that it's not just the US and Russia, but it's China and India and Japan and all these companies, all of which have the capabilities to do things that only a nation used to be able to do. And some of these companies are doing it because the owners just want to do things. So we're gone, we've gone beyond the point where we have to have a fancy scientific mission and a lot of you know, big words and so forth. Now a lot of things we're doing are because we can. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Keith, thanks so much for coming in. My pleasure. I'm sure you'll be glued to the set on Wednesday watching yes. this. Yeah.